fluid dynamics. So the goals for this session are threefold. One, we'll think about flowing fluids using an idealized system. Then we'll look at the continuity equation and then finally we'll look at Bernoulli's principle. And that's essentially conservation of energy applied to fluids. Okay, so let's start with an idealized fluid. And we idealize it how? Well, we say it has streamlined flow. That means there's no turbulence. We say it is incompressible. That means it has a constant density. And it has no viscosity. It flows without any resistance at all. Finally, four, it's irrotational. So it's got no swirling eddies in the flow pattern. Okay, so air flowing through a pipe might be a pretty good uh, fit for that idealization. You know, water is pretty good too. But if you're talking about uh, blood flowing through capillaries or honey flowing through a tube, not going to work. So there are limits to which you take all these things. Okay, so there are two basic equations we're going to apply to try and understand flowing fluids. One of which is the continuity equation. So it's a pretty simple idea. And what we imagine is that the rate at which mass flows past a point in the fluid is constant. Okay, so if you stand by you know, the, the tube and you just measure the amount of fluid that flows past you in a certain time interval, that's got to be the same at every point in the tube. Otherwise, either fluid's going to build up in regions of low flow rate or it's magically has to be manufactured in regions of high flow rate. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so the mass flow rate is a constant value. Okay, so what do we mean by the mass flow rate? Well, it's the amount of mass that goes past a certain point in the tube, any point in the tube, in a particular time interval. Well, that mass we can write as density times some volume, and volume we can write as area times some length, and now we've got a length over a time. Well, that's a speed, isn't it? Okay, so what we can say is that the mass flow rate is rho AV, the density times the area of the tube times the speed. Okay, so another way to say that is that at point one, we've got rho 1 A1 V1 has to equal rho 2 A2 V2. And one of our assumptions about our idealized fluid is that the density is constant, so rho 1 has to be the same as rho 2, so we can boil that down to simply A1 V1 is A2 V2. That's the continuity equation. So in this picture, you can see that in the part of the tube labeled 1, you've got a large cross-section, and then the tube narrows down, and as it does so, the fluid has to go faster to keep the flow rate the same. So there's the same amount of fluid going through the narrow part of the tube as there is through the wide part of the tube. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Fluid flows faster in narrow sections and slower in wider sections, of course. Okay, so you can uh, apply this to our own circulatory system. Okay, so when your blood flows from a large artery to a bunch of small capillaries, the rate at which it leaves the artery is equals the sum of the rates at which it flows through the various capillaries attached to that artery. Okay, so now let's talk about pressure. So continuity tells us the fluid speed is higher in the middle of this tube where it's narrower. What do you think about pressure? So along this center line where points 1, 2, and 3 are, where is the fluid pressure greatest? Which of those answers do you think is the best? Okay, so we'll look at a little simulation of this, animation of this. Okay, so you see the fluid going through the pipe, and what I hope you can see is that it starts off going fairly slowly and then goes up quite a bit faster through the narrow section and then slows down again as the pipe widens out on the right. Okay, so to make it go from slow to fast on the left side, you need a net force there accelerating the fluid from left to right and then to make it slow down at the other end when it comes out from the narrow part into the wide part you need a net force going to the left at that end okay so how do you get that well these forces come from differences in pressure between different parts of the tube so we must have 
high pressure at the two ends and low pressure in the middle where the flow is fastest. Okay, so let's now apply energy conservation ideas to fluids. And this is the second of two equations we use. So continuity is one, A1V1 is A2V2, that's nice and simple. And then we can apply our five term energy equation. So we expand our five terms, we get MGY1 plus one half MV1 squared plus work being done by non-conservative forces is MGY2 plus one half MV2 squared. Now the work can be thought of as some force times a distance on that uh, sort of fluid at, at point one and then if you imagine all the fluid between there and point two you've got a force times distance on the other end. Well you can write those forces as pressure times area. Okay, so you can expand WNC into two terms and you can move the minus P2A2 delta X2 to the other side and make it positive. Okay, so a lot going on in this equation. Now it's six terms, not just five. But let's divide through by volume. So if you divide the mass by volume, that reduce, that comes down to density. So all the m's go to m's over v's. Those are densities. And then area times delta x is a volume. So that just wipes out the a delta x pieces. OK, so then that's our what we call our Bernoulli equation. OK. So how do we think about this? Well, we apply Bernoulli's in the same way as our energy conservation equation, our five-term equation, but this is now a six-term equation, so we simply write it down and then start crossing terms out just like we did with the five-term energy equation. Okay, But it's a great way to relate uh, heights and speeds and pressures at two different places inside a flowing fluid. Okay, so that's a good introduction to fluid dynamics.